Good evening, everyone. Thanks so very much for joining us tonight uh, for our uh, City Dialogue Bangsa Malaysia. Tonight's session will be of uh, Kalau Rakyat Jadi Menteri, will be about economics, Hala Tuju Ekonomi Negara. And uh, joining us tonight, uh, we're very happy to have uh, Hafiz No Shams, who will be our guest speaker. We were also going to have uh, Nadia Jalil, but uh, she very unfortunately had an emergency tonight that she had to take care of. So we hope everything is okay, Nadia. Hope everything gets better. Um, we will just continue the session uh, since uh, we've set everything up. Uh, but we'll, we'll, these, these are just one of many sessions that we'll be having. Uh, Siri Dialogue Bangsa Malaysia is divided into dialogues about uh, the identity of Bangsa Malaysia and the shared values that you form it with uh, different uh, communities of identity and things like that. And then uh, the second type of uh, dialogue should be all about policy, uh, general, the, the policy directions of the nation. Okay, um, so I think we'll, uh, so just uh, welcome Harvis, thanks very much for joining us. <laughs> nice to see you, yeah. Uh, we'll just jump, jump straight into it now, right? Uh, okay, so I was joking on the WhatsApp group earlier that this session might be a little bit like uh, economics for dummies and I will play the dummy here. Like. <laughs> I never studied economics before, but you know, these things are, are, are meant to be um, a little bit of an introductory session. Um, general overview of the you know, nation's policy, policy directions and things like that. So before we go into the, the, the normal questions, you know, we had a good session on uh, education last time, you know, um, you know, and for education, it's very simple. In education, you, know, you want to assess education policies, we look at the education ministry, right? Um, but for economics, it's uh, quite, I think it's a bit more complex than that. You know, obviously, Menteri Kewangan, the finance ministry plays a big role, but there are all these other ministries, you know, uh, METI and stuff like that. So maybe, uh, you know, I, I, I think it's okay to share, right? That you used to work in the finance ministry as well, huh? uh, some time ago. So that's a good experience to draw. Can you give us a little bit about the overview? How does the government manage the economy, and what's the division of labor basically? Who does what in this whole uh, scheme of things? Right. Thanks, boss. Yeah, yeah. It's a little bit complicated because it's not. It's, there's no real clean cut on who's managed much where right? because the economy is so big, and obviously, first you have the finance ministry, but that's hardly the end of it. And if you think about it, even the education ministry has some role in economics, in the economy, right? Uh, you manage, you have your teachers, you have your workers, you have education, you have your children. Those are important to the economy as well. It's not just about money, it's also about the social side of things. Uh, if you think about further, even the rural, the rural ministry uh, is, has a huge role to play in, in, in advancing the economy, in economic growth especially. But, uh, at the very bottom, I suppose, at the very, at the very center, I, I suppose you could think there are at least three, at least three points of power in terms of managing the economy. First, the finance minister, obviously. Secondly, is the economic planning unit, which is under the prime minister office. That's more long-term planning. The minister of finance would be more on short term, medium term, I suppose, in terms of spending, year to year spending, and all those five. So the if you would think about development spending would be like five years, 10 years, 15 years. If you think about, if you want to think about it easily, the Ministry of Finance handle the yearly budget and the EPU would handle the inflation plan, right? So you, you, once you understand these two documents, the budget and the inflation plan, now you understand the division of labor, the division, division of responsibility between the two. And then it's not just a ministry. I think there's an, another point of power, a point of responsibility, which is the central bank. Right? The central bank is, is technically independent out of the ministry. It is, it is theoretically under the Ministry of Finance, but it's really quite independent. Even, even the Minister of Finance cannot really tell the governor to tell to do whatever you want. For instance, I mean, the, the, easier, the easiest example, I suppose, with the moratorium, right? People have been asking the finance minister to do something about it. But the finance minister, in normal time at least, uh, in emergency, there's a lot of argument whether you can do or not. But in normal times, the minister just cannot tell the, 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 the governor, the Bangladesh governor, to do whatever the government wants to do. 
even the Prime Minister cannot do that. Uh, so in that sense, they have three points of power in terms of econ managing the economy in the government, the central bank, the Ministry of Finance, and the EU. Thank you. Very, very illuminating for me. <laughs> So, so um, then you're saying, so finance ministry is saying it's really more short term, yearly budget is not really involved in long term economic planning, is that correct? Uh, it's, it's involved in it. I mean, um, when I say it's long term and short term, it's just a, a shorthand. Easy but it doesn't, process, take, right? the doesn't yeah. take the lead in terms of uh, long term economic planning. Yeah, I mean, I mean it does, it obviously it does get input and obviously in the short term and medium term, whatever the Ministry of Finance do, because it allocates money right now, affects what's going to happen in the future or even a long term. But in a general sense, the EU takes a very long-term view. So if you think about, you know, like investment in highways, like 10 years highway, or, or you want to have this, like, so before you had this national publicization and connectivity plan, which you have this broadband throughout Malaysia, that technically would be under the EPU. It will be under the telecom ministry as well, but the EPU would take the lead generally in that, theoretically. I hope you don't mind if you know we, we make this a, a lot of this session ends up being asking very basic questions. Huh? Right. I, I, I assume that you know uh, it's not general knowledge, uh, so but it's it's very interesting for me at least. Uh, so so um, you know and, and who, who prepares the budget? Uh, short. <laughs> it was a short answer to that. <laughs> who oh, prepares the, the, the national yearly budget annual budget? Uh, well, well the, the short answer is Minister of Finance, <laughs> the, the Ministry of Finance, right? Uh, right. The long answer is really the government. Uh, I mean, the government, and then, I mean, if you want, if you want me to explain the budget process, really budget process, what happens is that in, in February or March, uh, there will be a meeting inside the ministry that sets uh, the limit on your budget deficit, if I'm not mistaken. So, right, so, so it begins on that, how much deficit you want to have in the year. And then that thing would, would then uh, delegate it to the other side, it's a unit, there are two units. It's a one unit sets the limit, the yearly limit of spending, and the second limit uh, allocate the spending, right? So once once you, the, the unit that allocates the spending, which is a natural budget office, uh, they would go to all the ministries and ask what their, their plan for the year. So they would come back to you and say, this is my plan and this amount of money. So the, 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 and the, the, the office, the budget office would, would look at this requirement, and then decide how the money is allocated. Usually they would ask a lot of money and the MBO, the, the, the office will not fulfill all the requests. Most of the time not request it full because there will be some money and be some priority. And of course there's also the EPU which handles the, the development plan. Right? In, the, in the budget, there's actually two types of spending, the operating expenditure, which is your wages, your loan interest repayment, uh, there were a bunch of other stuff, it's, you know, typical operating expenditure. And then there's also the development expenditure, which is a long term stuff, right? That you, do, that you pay for building, maybe, I don't know, offices, build, uh, some sort of operational and development, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So it's like capital expenditure and operating expenditure, if you think about in terms of company uh, framework. So, 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 so they, they basically have the final say on the annual budget, uh, basically. Uh, so, so, so this thing, the process will happen, and then it, it also it, the government would have the agenda. The agenda will also uh, determine what kind of allocation or spending you want, right? So this thing would go go ding dong for like months throughout the year, and then once it finished, uh, then you go to the cabinet, and the cabinet would either give feedback or approve it or not. Right, right, and right. Of that, <laughs> And, and but basically, broadly speaking, this uh this yearly budget thing has to follow between the five year Malaysia plan that's uh, put out by the EPU. Um, uh, the, because again, the, the five year Malaysian plan pretty much di somewhat dictates the ex development expenditure. So the development expenditure is dictated by this five year plan, but the operating expenditure there's a lot more leeway in terms right, in terms right. of what the finance minister or the, the prime minister wants to do. Yeah. But then that, that also that also that doesn't 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 take into account some of the spending that you have to spend anyway. And that means that means that's pretty much means that actually the amount of money that you can spend on, for arbitrarily it's not that much because you have to pay your wages and you pay your interest repayment, you have to pay a bunch of stuff. So if yeah. you take that out, so the amount of money left, given the limit that they set uh, in the year, it's not that much. 
Right. So, because, you know, when we talk, I mean, I go slightly political aspects of it, right? Oftentimes, people think of the finance minister as like, oh, it's, you know, one of the top ministerial posts, one of the most coveted ministerial posts. But from your description, it sounds a little bit more like they're, I mean, it's, it's more like they just signed the checks only. Like, no, know, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, no, no, no. no. I mean, that's, just, that's just an unfair assessment, right? Uh, to say that the <laughs> minister, what you do is like just sign uh, some kind of check. You know, that's, that's a bit unfair because there's a lot of, policy that requires finance minister to agree to it. If he doesn't want to sign it, he can just say, I don't want to sign it. <laughs> and then things will get hair wire, right? And then yeah, I mean, but it, I mean, I, I, I'm just, uh, no, <laughs> and that's why you're here to help me, uh, help us yeah, understand yeah, the yeah, picture. Yeah. But I mean, it, it sounds like, yeah, he, he just has a lot of role in like approve and, you know, be the final, like, okay, not okay kind of thing, but. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean if, if you think about it, right, in the cabinet, there's only one person that can overrule the prime minister, which is, which is the finance minister in terms of allocation. One person that cannot what? There's one person in the in cabinet that can overrule the prime minister in terms of spending is the finance minister. So those so shows up. The prime minister can say, oh, we don't have the money to do yeah, this. Theoretically, it doesn't happen. <laughs> but theoretically, that, that's within his power. Uh, so this shows how the finance minister is actually quite powerful. Ah, so, so, yeah, but, 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 it, but you also say that he doesn't really drive you know, the economic direction of the country, so to speak. They, 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 can, they can drive. They, depending on the limit that you set as well. I mean, this is a bit, I'm, I'm being unfair a little bit, but, but sometimes it all starts when, when you set the, the budget that's the limit, right? The spending limit. Depending on your agenda, you can have, play around with this limit. If you want set the to, limit uh, for each ministry, is that correct? I'm saying that, yes, but also more importantly, the limit for the whole government, the whole of government spending. So for instance, if you want to have a 4% deficit, uh, then you have 4% of, of deficit kind of spending that you can do. If you want to have a 2%, then you have only 2%. Those, so he, he manages how much money the, the government can spend in a year. So, so if, if you really believe in like fiscal consolidation, then there's not much money to play. Like. If you don't believe in it, you, you have other agenda, then, then you will set a more, a more, I suppose, loose spending for right, the right. kind of agenda. It can, it can be anything the agenda is. Right, right, right. So again, in theory, you know, so you're saying the finance minister can tell the prime minister, no, you can't do this, you can't do that. But of course, in theory, the prime minister can just replace the finance minister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's also there's also politics in it, which is you know you cannot you cannot divorce politics from the economy management of the economy. Right, right, right. I mean, does does the finance minister decide how much money each ministry gets, how to allocate between ministries? Yeah, I can. Yeah, I think pretty much. That's pretty much it. Uh, because, because at the end of the day, there's a limit that the government can spend that has set by the Ministry of Finance, and they have the Ministry of Finance have to allocate this this money. So by the, by by that by that by that logic as well, then you set the limit. In theory, is the power more or less absolute? So like say you know okay, you're the Agriculture Ministry, you get this much, and that's what I say, and suck it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, there's a lot of negotiation happening. So. You, you set the limit at first, and then this negotiation comes and say, oh, we need this, we need this, we need this because of this. It, 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 it all part of this process. is a process that's like ultimately arbitrated by the prime minister, or is it just kind of like theoretically stopped? Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean uh, uh, if things cannot really cannot be reconciled between the two ministers, then probably the prime, prime minister can come in. But I think usually, and usually, uh, usually they, they work it out somehow. Yeah, so it's quite interesting. I mean, it's it's Powerful, but not powerful. Influential, but not influential. It's an interesting mix. <laughs> it is, it's about check and balance, right? I mean, they are, they are check and balance in the government. It's just a matter of how you wield the power. I guess, right? it's, I guess it's designed that way, like, in theory. Yeah, it's yeah, designed that way. I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good check, check and balances in government. It's just like sometimes people are a little bit, becoming a little bit too smart. <laughs> overcome <laughs> in, the check and balance. in practice, it doesn't work, like, but in theory, there is. There is I mean, I mean, I mean there, are, there, are, there are a lot of cases where it works. There's also a lot of cases that it doesn't work. Uh, right. So it's, it's, it's difficult to give a sweep, but then again, there are a lot of cases that shows it doesn't work as well. So real quick question, uh, EPU, right? It seems like a very powerful, uh, I mean, so, I mean, the name says it all, right? You're planning the economy of the country. Hmm. So um, and who is it? So the, the person who's really driving the EPU and the decision maker, the EPU, is it a civil servant or is it a... Um, it's, a it's a minister. It's a minister in, in charge of the economy. Under, under Pakata time, under Pakata time, it was a... Uh, Azmin. 
was Azmin, which was actually the EPU. The EPU was taken out of the PMO and become a ministry by itself. But now it's becoming a, a, a unit in the PMO as well, which is uh, being hated by and a minister. At the time, it was the Ministry of Economic Affairs, is that? Yeah, which is pretty much EPU. Sorry, which is the, basically the EPU. EPU what about EPU. previously? Um, because previously, that's, the, that's the first time that they've done that, right? That they have a ministry for this. I'm um, not quite sure whether it's the first time, but it will definitely previously was EPU like, under the PMO. Was it was it headed by a minister at the PM's department? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, because right now, right now, the is headed by Mustafa Muhammad, if I'm not mistaken. And before, mm-hmm. before, before Pakatan, he was, uh, was 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 the Maybank person. I can't remember the CEO. The, the ex CEO. Um, yeah. So, so mm-hmm. they, they, they were ministers in charge of. Oh, in Oxford, I think. Yeah. I can't remember, but what so they were ministers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But they're generally quite low profile, these, these ministers. Uh, they don't really hear anything from Topa. That, that Maybank guy was also quite quiet, maybe by nature. But. Uh, yeah, I mean, it depends on the person. I mean, Topa has always been low profile, right? He's more, I suppose, democratic, I suppose. And but yeah, also, uh-huh. saying, you know, these are the guys that are really deciding, like, you know, what Malaysia's economy we're focusing on, you know, what's, the, what's our big economy uh, and things like that. Is that, is that their yeah. role? Yeah, but I mean, is it is it, a bit hard to say that they are actually the one that determines the economic direction of the country, right? Because again, the economy is huge and there's a lot of players involved, and I mean, sometimes even Minister of Tech, Minister of Communication, I'm sure, uh, what we call it, multimedia and communication has a role to play, right? Mm-hmm. Because it's, yeah, yeah. because of course, every, is you're absolutely but, right. Every ministry has an economic aspect to it, definitely. You know? Yeah, but, but I mean, but, if but, there, is, but, there is someone who's looking at the big picture, right? You know, there is someone who's like whose job it is to like think about the economy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, if you if you think if you, if you read the Malaysia plan, that's supposed to be the big picture document that, that guides where the, the government wants to bring the country forward. But that's that's pretty much the summary, I suppose. I think I think we were I think. I, Ellen, either in conversation or I can't remember, or Twitter or something, he was talking about that. You know, some of these Malaysia plan documents were really good. There was one that he liked, I can't remember, from some time ago. Lah. But uh, probably from the 70s, God. <laughs> uh, yeah, it could be. I, I, I forget which one it was. But, um, but yeah, I mean, are, are these documents, you know, I, I assume you've read a number of them over, you know, uh, over time and how they evolve. I mean, I mean, you know, when people like me, when you talk about, you know, Malaysia plan, it's just a big, thick document that I don't understand anything about. <laughs> but how, 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 how have they evolved over the years? Are they really a, are they a really a core document? Do people really follow? Do we follow them? Or these studies, or are these kind of things like just way things that they put out and not really followed? You know, how influential are they? Uh, how, what has their prestasi been over the, well, over the decades? Well, uh, I mean, I have to be honest, I haven't read all on the oh, plan because it's quite yeah. a thick document and, and you know it has to be really really interested in those plans if you want to read it. Even the latest one which was which was under Pakatan, I, I didn't read that much because because you know it's, it's just thick. Um, but I know some of the plans that they want to do and, and for instance um, they want to do shared prosperity kind of thing. So they, they set a plan, I mean they set up some kind of a big goal that you want more equal society kind of thing. In fact, if you think about it, uh, the NEP, for instance, that was listed down in the in the nation plan, right? Nation plan sets uh, the, the goal targets. So those are the things. Even in the 90s, you set the kind of industry you want to, to, to pursue. Um, yeah. Right, right, right. Um, I'll come back to the Malaysia plan in a, in a little while then. Uh, just briefly about the, the central bank. Again, again, I get for me, mm. right? Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, the independence of the central bank, I mean, that's a standard thing all around the world, right? Yeah, they they mm. Can you, I mean, it's a bit like the ju- judiciary in, in some ways, right? It, it's like, mm. uh, can, can you explain to us uh, why that independence is important and how they kind of fit into the. I mean, I didn't right. know that the central bank is the one that decides on our moratoriums. I feel a bit or, shy. Or, I didn't know that. Or, or, or they, 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 they don't, it's not the it's not the what I call that central bank that decides on monetarium. But you just they just manage the financial sector. Mm. But they don't yeah. decide on the monetarium. But yeah. 
but, but to come back to your question about the importance well, why is it I mean, well, well, what is the what is it that the why is this independence so important you know uh, right. how I mean, the bank, uh, central banks you know uh, yeah oh. so so in theory in theory in a democracy right uh, so in a democracy uh, i mean the generally the incentive of those in power is really they want to have a booming economy right that was every, every single government wants. If you, the economy booms and people will be happy, then people will be happy, they will put you back in part of the office. So, I mean, one way to make the economy boom is to just keep interest rate low forever. I mean, you, for instance, uh, I mean, in, in put simplistically, they, they, sometimes there are two goals, inflation and unemployment, and the, the, the goal of reducing unemployment, uh, some, I mean, in, in an orthodox way of thinking is that if you lower unemployment, then inflation is going to go up, right? So, so if you're a populist government, I mean, if you're even a democratic government or even populist, you, you want to have a big economy, so you would push the interest rate up in normal times. And now it's a little bit crazy, but, but in normal times, uh, you would want to push the interest so low. And then, I, and so if you want your unemployment to be so low, so the, the, the interest rate, gonna, I mean, the inflation, sorry, not interest rate, inflation going to go up. So the central bank is supposed to be independent and, and moderate that impulse of pushing the unemployment down and not giving, not, not giving inflation, uh, um, you know, not caring about it. So that's, that's one reason why... Uh, Central bank dependence is important, but another one is really because the government also wants money all the time, right? So if there's no independence, then the government can just go to the central bank and ask for money, and they would print it. Uh, in fact, this is this is not just theory, right? In, in Turkey, what, what Erdogan Erdogan is doing is that Erdogan is just wants the interest to go so low so that he, because the economy is such a bad bad bad, bad, um, bad situation, they want the economy to to boost the economy and they want to leave it so low. And then what happened is that Erdogan fired the central bank, the central bank government, and took a, uh, and chose a new one that would listen to the prime minister. So that's so right now in Turkey the inflation is going crazy uh, because interest is interest is not allowed to be used to. Right. Know. So so again, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> Quite. Not very good at these things. So the central bank uh, has a you know basically a lot of control about inflation and unemployment, uh, and the flow of money. Uh, I suppose. The, 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 uh, in orthodox way of thinking, the central bank has control over inflation. I mean, not inflation in terms of interest rate. So they have control over the interest rate, and then from the interest rate, they would go in managing the inflation numbers. Right. But right. the thing is, inflation and unemployment cannot be divorced easily. So if you control inflation, you would translate into the unemployment rate to go into the economy or right. there's a whole lot of linkage. Uh, uh, and uh, so the, the, the reason why central banks are always independent are uh, because they tend to have different interests than politicians. Uh, is that yeah, it's, it's supposed to be the technocrats. Like. Technocrats are supposed to be the more neutral, more more forward thinking. Because uh, if not, then we get what, what we got in um, Turkey. Like, you know, when it's a little theoretically, bit... Like, theoretically, like. I mean, it's, it's not it's not a hard pass rule, right? But sometimes it's a lot of also sometimes the the politician are right, sometimes. But you know, but the the central bank is to manage the impulses of the government. Right, right. Manage them. I like the way you put that. It's it's true, right? I mean, for instance, if you go to the judiciary and the government. The government will always want some cases. You only want to in some cases, but you should want one that moderate those uh the those impulses by becoming you know the arbitrator. I mean the the neutral party. Generally speaking, uh, o- over time, how has uh, the independence of our central bank been? I think that I think the central bank is quite independent and 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 has like a really good reputation. Uh, I mean, as, what, as, as, as a really good reputation, mm. uh, locally, internationally, I think. I think if especially since since that time, and uh, uh, there, there, there was trouble in the nineties, but I think uh, Zeti especially rebuilt that reputation, and now so I think I think it's quite respected. Now still okay? I think pretty much pretty much okay. Mm-hmm. I think it's pretty much still respected. I mean, I would be, you know, criticized if I see otherwise, of course. <laughs> because because I mean it's not it's not because of it's political, it's because it's hard to think that central bank is not 
it's not as as good as it was. I mean, it's, it's really good. And, and just real quick, so so moratoriums. When you talk about loan moratoriums in COVID mm -hmm. time, and all that, who makes the final decision on that? Or who's the? Who, who... I I I actually, I actually don't know. But because it was in normal time, nobody has power over that. Not even as not not the finance minister, not the governor. It's it's really. So you, you know, cannot I, by law under normal time you cannot compel the banks. These yeah, type yeah. Of banks I mean, to... you, you don't live in a dictatorship, right? Uh, in, in normal times you don't even dictatorship. Like the emergency, the, law, emergency, emergency law doesn't did it cover that? That yeah. one I don't know. That one I I have to ask a lawyer la, because at the end of the day it's a fine pitch. I mean, yeah. I don't think it was mentioned, but I'm not sure that. Yeah. I I don't know. I I wouldn't I wouldn't I don't have the guts to say. <laughs> okay. So I just don't know. Coming back to some big picture things, all right. Now, so you know one of the things I think that you you were talking about earlier that uh, I think was quite interesting, meaningful, and <coughs> you talked about complexity. Right? You know, economy is huge. You know, it's like everything is it's like politics, right? Everything is politics. What is not politics? You know, yeah. everything is the economy. Everything touches the economy, and uh, the economy touches everything. You know, and each ministry has got its own economic aspect and stuff like that. And it's so complex. You know, and of course you are. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I say one of the more prominent economists in Malaysia, right? <laughs> oh, I don't think so. I mean, I don't know. Up there, la, you know, at, at least, at least second tier, at least, at least. Maybe. Oh, that's just an insult now. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but even you don't read the, the, the Malaysia plans, you know, I'm sure you don't read Lagi, I surely wouldn't read, you know, what one to read. I mean, are there people who read the Malaysia plan as a whole? <laughs> you know, um, but, but again, so complexity, right? And then again, what I was planning to get apart earlier is like, um, you know, I mean, all I, I guess, of course, all ministries all have complexity. Like, it's not like education ministry, whatever the minister decides, and all just happens to way. There's yep. always a, yep. there's always a entrained structure, deep state, mm -hmm. and all that kind of nonsense, right? But um, but yeah, you know, so so if like when I mean, let's just say like you know, a lot of this uh, series of dialogue, a lot of a lot of what we're looking at also is um, this uh question of like how would we do it differently, right? So you know one of the first one of the first questions is uh how would who do what differently? <laughs> you know, I mean again you, you talk about EPU, I mean from best I can gather from you know EPU in terms of policy, in terms of like trying to sketch out the future of the country, the direct economic direction as big picture as possible. That's very much EPU, like right. Um, but it seems like in the past, these ministers, I, mean, I don't know, I'm just a I just a guy who reads the news <laughs> headlines and stuff like that, but it doesn't seem like they've been playing a very strong driving force you know to, to, to really like take the you know take a firm grip on the reins and things like that i mean but is that is that the the right place to start you know um if, if let's say let's just say like, all of us are right. government today right so yeah. it, it comes to like i mean is there i mean you know under mahate that in ph the time i guess like, it's the economy star right it's like oh everything go through has been terrible decision but, <laughs> but that was a that was a theory right i mean uh, you know so is it is an approach like that, um, you know, maybe with a better person, <laughs> you know, is that kind of approach like how we would do slightly more uh, coherent, uh, you know, um, coordinated approach to you know, looking at the big picture of our economy and, and, and charting our economy into the right direction before we do what going before we go into what we would do. <laughs> I just want to be clear, like who are the ones that would be doing, or how would you how would you um, you know arrange this sort of like team and division of labor and stuff like that? What's the right. Yeah, what's a what's I mean, a good effective dynamic way to do it? Yeah, I I mean I mean I mean I I think I think if you want to do whatever change or anything, I think I think the best way to start is actually the prime minister. Of course. Because the prime minister is the one that sets the agenda, <laughs> right? And then when you set the agenda, then other people fill in the details. That was supposed to the minister should be. I mean, if you have a prime minister that doesn't 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 share what the in charge of you doing or the financial minister is doing, then the agenda we just wouldn't go, right? Because at the end of the day, I mean, uh, truthfully, I mean, you can talk about theory, but at the end of the day, practically at the cabinet meeting, if prime minister says no, especially if it's, it's a strong prime minister, and then everybody gonna say, okay, we think about it, and then we say no, <laughs> we agree with you, we agree with you. So, so I mean, if it's a weak prime minister, then we also cannot cannot do anything. Uh, so you have to be have a prime minister that is common respect from your from his peers. And mm. also visionary and have an agenda in, in the mind. Uh. So mm. that's that's so if you want to get things right, you have to get things right at the top. Uh. 
Right, right, right. So, I mean, obviously, like, I don't know, Prime Minister, of course, for us, power, for Japan, we are a big believer in decentralization. <laughs> we don't yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but I mean, you, you, I mean, you, you can decentralize power, obviously, but yeah. you will have to have a shared, a shared aspiration. If you don't have a shared aspiration, then if you decentralize, then things are going to go nowhere. People are going to be cursed um, yeah. on, on every single agenda. So, that so, also doesn't work. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, you know, so, 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 I mean, but of course, the prime minister's role, I mean, the prime minister or whoever or whatever, a committee that we would to replace the prime minister, if I would have my way, right? Um, you know, their job is to, to look at everything. Uh, of course, you can't look at the economy, you got to look at right. 100 okay. other things, right? So, right. like, uh, but the, the, the main players in the economic team, right? The, the main, the most, or at least within the current bureaucracy, the current uh, system and all that, right? Uh, I mean, you can always change it on more. Or, or, oh yeah, you can just tell us how you, what you think it will change. But I assume like, you know, again, there's a minister in charge of EPU, finance minister. I guess the central bank governor is not really part of the government policy making process. Is, is, are they, is that, is that, I mean, are they brought into, uh, I mean, who's, who's sitting at the table making the most important decisions? Who should be sitting at the table making the most important decisions Regarding the economy as a whole, I think it should be. I, mean, I don't know. It's, I, mean, I mean, it sounds like the cabinet should, should sit on it, right? Because at the end of the day, like, like, I mean, we have to go back to the, our earlier point. Uh, the economy is so big. Yeah. And, and the cabinet, much, yeah. our cabinet is like 30, 40 people. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even, even if, you, if you, even you downsize the cabinet, you still have all these people have to be sit together and think about it, right? Because at the end of the day, you have to think about, like, for instance, uh, if you want some industry of the future, and you want in the future some industry to, to look at the nature, right? And then that's not just the job of the EPU, it's also the job of the, of the education minister. Sure. The education minister has to think about this thing, and then you have to think about labor, which is uh, for the ministry. I mean, and you have to think about... Of, of course, you know, of course, the more people involved, the better, like, since again, the economy touches everything, right? But if it's a uh, five to 10 people, kind of, uh, this sure. one, more often on this, who, who would that be? I mean, again, the obvious ones are uh, EPO minister, the prime minister, I guess, uh, the finance minister. Yep. The central bank governor is not really invited to these things, is he? Uh, I think in like, long term plan, not, not really. I mean, so the, the governor was more interested in monetary policy, which is not fiscal policy. But, I mean, generally, because again, we go back to the independence of the central bank, right? So the reason why the is that the central governor is, is separated from the executive. So, so, separated so, from the yeah. normal so, so, so the central bank governor also doesn't, is basically not a job to try and uh, influence government policy. Or yeah, he, he or she does try to influence government policy, but sometimes government policy influences monetary policy. But they do uh, talk so like, there's always uh, concept. They, they do talk like, they do talk like. Okay, so again, um, you know, it, it's the, the uh, EPU guy, Person, uh, the the what is the finance minister? Yep, Who else yes. is um, really important? If it's a five ten group, uh, are there any uh, other? It's also the meeting 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 ministry. Mm. Uh, yes. <laughs> I forgot that, that was my other question, right? So obviously, like I said, obviously every ministry is involved. But which are the uh, besides the finance ministry? Which are the most important ministries that are plugged in the yeah, economic stuff? Uh, international uh, trade and industry is that that's yeah, right? Yeah, what probably. else? I mean, if you, if you think about cabinet as it is right now, if you think mm. about economy, then you have to think about um, plantation, mining, uh, labor. So it's agriculture? agriculture? Yeah. It's a human resources ministry, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because okay. at the end of the day, all this, all this ministry, they are, they are responsibility overlaps with each other. Because if you want, if you want METI to, to encourage certain industries, then the labor ministry also have to. So quick, 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 quick question on METI, right? right. Straight, I mean, it's called international trade and industry. I just only, I mean, so industry is, I assume that's why we go to METI to get our letters or all that stuff, right? right. But aren't, aren't these two things like quite a little bit different? International trade and industry is, has it, has it always been one ministry? Is that, is that a logical? Uh... Well, because, I, I, because, I didn't, well, because, it, because at the end of the day, the, the, the base of the the base of the economy is really the industries, right? The industries. If you don't have the industries, then you don't have international trade. I mean, you can have, but because the, because Mal the way Malaysia were designed in my uh, it's its economic policy was that for for like you know for the past forty years, I guess fifty years, is export led industrialization. So there's a export bias in the way Malaysia Malaysia manages their industries. 
so because of the expert bias, and then you, you, I think because of that, so it's just natural to merge the two sides together, the industries and its natural trade. So that, you know, you encourage your industries to go abroad, to, to compete in the international market, to export stuff. And Miti now is Asbin. Before this yep. was uh, Ken Ming, is it? Ken Ming was deputy. Uh, he was uh, Daryl Aikin. Daryl. Daryl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. So, so yes, uh, so uh, finance ministry, um, EPO ministry such department, uh, MITI, uh, agriculture, uh, mining comes under. Partition. I think partition, I can't remember. Uh. Yes. But, but the, 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 the primary, in, the industry, the primary industries, the industries have to be in. Uh. Right, right, right. Okay. So I cannot remember the, the division, like mining, who is under. I think it's primary industries. Which is the past person? I feel I feel very really shy. I don't even know. So there's a Ministry yeah. of Primary Industries. Is that right? I think so. I remember correctly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe Hamid or Julian can help to do some of googling for us. I didn't do my homework. So yeah, I mean, um, with that you know, when it comes to like the, is I don't know, is the Malaysia plan like too big a document that is unwieldy and you know, it's just kind of like a Frankenstein kind of thing? Hey, they better what. It depends on what you want. And if you know what you want, if you know what you're looking for, then it's the right document. It's like it's like Nascopedia, I suppose. If you know what you want to read in Nascopedia, then you know what to look at. If you have no idea, then... Okay. Maybe, I, I'm sorry, I, I'm also groping around the dark a little bit, but I'll put it this way, okay? Now, my, my area of interest is a lot about decision-making process, right? How do we make decisions? Who calls the shots, right? right. So, again, if, if you are trying to to develop a system where we really want the best for Malaysia's economy, right? right. We just want good, <laughs> all the good things, right? So mm -hmm. what kind of like decision-making process or decision makers, you know, what kind of like um, you know, process kind of thing do you think would, would help us come up with the, the, the best decisions for the economy? You know, what, again, like who's in that room? How do they, how are you going plan? Or like, you know, based on what you've seen before, what, what, what are things that have worked, haven't worked? Have been problematic as far as um, what is it as far as uh, decision making processes go and things like that. Uh, it's a bit of abstract a question. I'm sorry, but uh, if you have any thoughts on this, you know, I'd be definitely be. I mean, no, because it's okay. I, I just give a bit, a bit more background, okay? When when it, so for someone like me, when it comes to like solving problems, right? I mean, it's like you know, you got to get the right people in the right process. And then you can solve the problem <laughs> or a chunk of it, like a good chunk of yep. it, right? Um, so but, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is, I know. As, as you can see, I'm struggling to answer the question because I know that's probably not what you usually think about. <laughs> but you know, no, 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 no. It's not. It's not. It's not that. It's just that you know you're talking about the right person in the right job. But, but the thing is, there's so many people involved in it, right? It's not just the ministers, really. It's just yeah. Uh, it's just that there's ministers and then the advisors and then the officers and these officers also think uh, uh bounce idea with the ministers. Hmm. So is is the people that surround the ministers? I think, I think a lot of time it's the people that are around the ministers that matters right, uh, right. rather than the ministers themselves. Or maybe I think even once. Although that, that's a bit, a, bit, a bit crazy to say, but <laughs> not, not, not exactly true. But, but the people surrounding the ministers or the prime ministers also oh, support them. Yeah, I mean, half the time the ministers are idiots, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, uh, I mean, maybe I, I take one step further back a little bit, right? Again, so for me, you know, solving most problems, like I said, it's a matter of like getting the right people in the right room with the right process kind of thing, right? right. So, so when I think about economy, you know, that's my approach to the problem, right? That's I, I just got to get the right people in the right room, you know, with the right process. What about you? You know, like let's say, uh, just uh, the whole idea of this is to is to become imagine, right? So let's say now you're in a, a key decision making. Uh, um, role in, in, in the way the, the, the country is run and things like that. So when it comes to economy, how do you set, I mean, obviously you can't do it all by yourself. No one right, person right. can like manual. So what are the important, you know, what do you do in order to make sure that good economic decisions are made? <laughs> I think, you know, I, I think, I think in the first place, the person that decides, that decides at the end of the whole, you know, I mean, minor, of, minor authority has to have the right idea, like the right agenda in mind. And yeah. then once, once you have the right agenda in mind, then you have to have the, the civil servant that is prepared to, to, to serve you. Lah. I, mean, the, I mean, to be fair, there's a lot, lot of civil servants that might disagree with you, that will do it. And if, then if you don't agree with it, then it will do half, half, half the day, right? So you have the people in the right the civil service, which you don't, is you don't really control, I guess. 
Uh, so that's also important in the civil service itself. And um, because it, it, it might be an over, you may exaggeration, but if you think about, yes, prime minister, right? The civil <laughs> service in that, in that episode is so powerful that the minister uh, gets frustrated. Right? Yeah. yeah that, 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 there is an element of truth in that thing. Um, so that's also important. I mean, getting the right people in the, in the civil service as well. Did you have other kind of frustrations in your time there last time? Uh, I mean, it, it's, just, it's just part of the job, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting that show is decades old, but still so frighteningly relevant. Okay, okay. Uh, um, enough of my funny, weird questions, all right? We go back to some of the, the, the normal basic questions we asked about, about, about um, on this series, right? So Malaysia's economy. Um, right. We want to talk successes, failures, and then uh, what you believe our priority, uh, our policy priorities should be in order right. to go back uh, in order to do very really well, right? So yeah, what are the best things, best successes of Malaysia's Economy. <laughs> uh, I think to talk about generally, I think we, we before before this before whatever crisis we're having right now, I think we pretty we built quite a robust uh, middle class, and they they were they were we could do better, but I mean our middle class was was quite quite solid for a while, and and if you if you see that middle, middle, our middle class is now, you know. Uh, um, well sought abroad, right? I mean, they work in big um, multinational abroad in Singapore, in Hong Kong, even in New York or London, whatever, in Sydney. So we, we did build a strong middle class. I mean, when our middle class was much, much ahead than a lot of the countries, like for China, for instance, our middle class was much stronger than China for a long time until recently. And, and I think that's our, one of our biggest success. And then, and yeah. I think that's one of the biggest success. Uh, what, 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 what contributed to that success? How did we build such a good middle class? All right. Uh, I, I, I would point it to our lower industrialization, industrialization back in the 1980s and the 90s, right? Which also uh, yeah. was. Built... <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, you no. Know, you know, if you think, if you think of other countries as well, uh, they also industrialized. Uh, not not like like Thailand in Thailand and I can Thailand is the closest in terms of industrialization compared to Malaysia, but the closest to Malaysia. I mean, and then there's also Singapore, which is another class. Uh, so so the industrialization of during two decades, regardless of who was in power, was a real driver in building that middle class, right? So it's just uh, and then the boom. And, and for Malay, for Malaysia case, I think ironically the I call that the affirmative action in the 70s help uh, brought about oh, the, the affirmative action, the ah. NAD in mm. the 70s. I think it brought about the transformation of the middle class because it suddenly brought in a huge, a huge number of people into the urban areas, which was which were the industrial centers and brought in labor. And so, that's, that's pretty much success. La. So basically, NAP considered an early success la, back in the day. Uh, I wouldn't take the whole of NAP, but an aspect of it that the block bringing in the, the population, the population, yeah, urbanization, which urbanization also assisted together with industrialization that happened in that time, also the globalization that happens later as well. That that's contributed to have Malaysia having a healthy middle class for for a long time. Right, right. How about um successes in terms of like particular industries? Um, uh, we, you know, I think our E&E, &E, electronics and uh, electrical and electronics industry is quite strong, especially Penang, since the 1970s. They had some trouble in 2000 when China was rising, but I think it's, 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 it's still strong right now. So I that's think, a driver? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a driver. Also, the oil and gas, we did pretty well in oil and gas, I, especially if compared to Indonesia, which is much older industry than ours, it's much bigger. And, but our ONG is it's much more complex and more, more advanced. Uh, I think those, those are a success story. Uh, we did we tried to do much manufacturing. That what that manufacturing? We tried to do manufacturing in terms of like automotive that didn't do quite well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, again, again, if you you want to see whether it's successful or not, you make comparison with other countries, right? In terms of proton, we compare with uh, Bangkok. Rayong, I mean, quite clear, Rayong is, 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 is the center of automotive the in Southeast Asia. Uh, so that shows that Malaysia failed and Thailand succeeded. And How about uh, agricultural? 
Uh, uh, I'm not quite sure. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to say the culture, we had some hit and miss. We clearly, but, but, but then again, our culture, especially Rabu and Palm oil, seems to be a legacy for the cold wound areas. So we did right, just like expanding on it. And they did pretty well. Uh, but I think it's not, it's not, what I call that. The problem is it's still labor intensive. Like it's not, it's not, it's not, uh, it could go up the value chain much, much higher, but it's not. Hmm. Okay. Very good. Very good. Thank you. Now, all right. So that's the things that we've done fairly well. Uh, what have we done terribly in terms of economic management and <laughs> direction of economy? What have our biggest mistakes been? Biggest blunders? Biggest problems? Uh, yeah, I, yeah. I think that's. I think. I think. If when we when we talk about you know building the media class, uh, I think the media class, the process of building the media class somehow slowed after the financial crisis in 1997, 1998. So I think that's our biggest failure. Like we 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 had some successes. And then we didn't build on that successes. So that's why we are behind uh, when compared to other countries like South Korea, for instance. And South Korea, we were on par with them like at one time in the 90s. Now we are way, way far behind. Uh, so those, those are, I think, again, going back to the, 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 the success of building the middle class, and then we did just keep them this healthy. Uh, I think that's our mistake. And then, and then now the problem is that the middle class is having a problem because of the COVID crisis, and then it's going to be uh, a long-term challenge. Like. And when people talk about long COVID, right? People about people that had COVID and then they had uh, trouble later. Mm. The same thing with the economy, right? There's long COVID issues. Suddenly, middle class have no savings. Suddenly, the middle class, uh, yeah, their children in terms of education, uh, you know, the the level of education they get is not there. Because of disruption that happened this year and last year, so those are the challenges that we might have uh, in terms of building the middle class, making the middle class stronger. Right. So, um, and, and you said we 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 didn't build on the middle class, and like I mean, were there specific failures, specific ways in which you know, you know policy mistakes that we made that ended up in our uh, you know stagnating after in, after the nineties and where other guys went, kept on going up. Uh, it's a bit hard to pinpoint one, but I think. Uh, a lot of people say that uh, because of technology, we didn't import that much technology. We didn't, uh, um, and it's also corruption. I don't know. I think is it a harder question than I, I think a bit hesitate to give an answer. Mm. Uh, but those are two. I mean, I, from a lay person, you say a lack of uh, investment in technology. And of course, corruption. I mean that. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I, mean. I think I think maybe maybe I mean if you give a a PD answer, maybe we didn't invest enough. We didn't invest enough in in our industries or in in our infrastructure. Uh, we, uh, what I call that, and then what's an education system? There's a lot of complaint about our education system, which is not preparing people for 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 the future. And the education become politicized, and then we don't, you know, you don't focus on stuff that matters. We focus on stuff that, you know, language. Uh, I mean, language are important, but sometimes the politics of language uh, takes other stuff away from it. And then the sort of religion, issue of religion, uh, that takes at the stage when we talk, should be talking about, you know, talking about ability to, you know, to code or to do mathematics or to read and write critically, but we focus on the wrong stuff. Uh, like this goes back to the, the initial idea that like the economy is so big that it's not necessarily just finance or economy. It's also education, right? Education has a very long term effect on the economy. If you get education wrong, then in the very long term, and then the, the economy can suffer because the labor force is going to be like that. Uh, the labor force is not competitive, or it's, it's, not, it's not just comp I, I hate the word competitive, but I'm saying that the labor force is not like critical of what I think. Right? It's not just about engineering, it's also just, you know. Thought process, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's about critical thinking. If you if you that's not there as it should, then it, and then you have other people that do better than us, then you start to start behind them. Right, right, right. So um, I mean, uh, you, of course, I love what you say about you know we were talking about things that we were fighting about things that don't matter as much, <laughs> or fighting about things for the wrong reasons, and then ignoring the things that are, that do matter, like 
the things that I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't matter all these things, right? Yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, like, language is an identity. We, we get caught up to a lot of people. Yeah, we get caught up in. But we, we we caught up in the culture yeah. war. We caught up in the culture war, and then exactly. we forgot about our our economic uh, agenda. We get up in uh, counterproductive arguments. Uh, let, let's yeah. say uh, yeah. we, we're focusing on the wrong aspects of the argument. Uh, but I think this is very much what we are on the Project Bank Indonesia side. We are very interested to reverse. Uh, and we figure out the only way to do that is to do it like this uh, by practice. Bit by bit, person by person, Milo by Milo, as I like to say. <laughs> but yeah, so we're trying to bring the conversation back to the stuff that matters, uh, not the stuff right. that matters, to make a clear distinction between the two and why mm -hmm. we should be focusing on one thing instead of the other. Yeah, so 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 that's uh, that's interesting. Okay, um, yeah, I'll come back to more things, but uh, uh, policy priorities. Right. right. So, <laughs> so how do we fix all this ridiculous mess? Or is it just too damn big to fix? <laughs> or where do you start? Uh, where do you start? Right? Uh, I, I don't have all the answers, definitely. <laughs> I also don't know where to start sometimes. Yeah. But I think I think I think one way, one one thing that you can start is really um you know building a social system net. Because right now the initial social system net is a little bit uh disjointed, disparate. And you know, it's, it's no universal. The way we do it is that we have we fund our health system, and then the health system is not cheap. But uh, there's still people that fall through the cracks, and then there's there's, there's insurance here and there. Uh, so it's, it's about it's, you know there's a multiple layer that doesn't there's no uniform layer that that serves as social safety net. I think that's what we should think about. Uh, I mean, there there are models out there. Maybe before you do the rest, in case I forget later, right? So, um, I mean, can you, can you just walk us through a little bit about what a social safety net should, should look like and how right. is it, why is it important to the economy as a whole and stuff like that? So, a social safety net essentially just that to ensure everybody, every single person uh, enjoy a, a somewhat a minimum level of welfare. So, everybody, when they fall, baseline. there's a baseline. So it could be in terms of health, in terms of you know jobs, for instance. So UBI. Uh, UBI yeah, UBI could, could be, could be. Uh, so the point is that you know uh, we want to take care, take care. I mean the worst, the worst people that have been hit hard the worst, right? Uh, so that they can uh, bring themselves up. Uh, also, it's not just that. Sometimes it's just also an automatic stabilizer for the economy. Sorry, it's, it's, it's not because the safety social safety net. It's not just about, uh, I'll call it guaranteeing some kind of minimum welfare for all these people. But it's also a automatic stabilizer to the economy, right? And a what? Sorry. Sorry, an automatic stabilizer. Automatic stabilizer. To the economy. How, so how so? So, for instance, uh, for instance, every time there's crisis, the government like. Would, would want to spend and it's spend in the, in the panic mode. You want to spend fast with your heart in the panic mode, right? So 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 when you do that, it's, it's always lack in terms of in terms of recognition and in terms of implementation of this policy, right? But if you have a social, I wouldn't call it major, but it just take I mean, there's a response leg out to, what, to to whatever crisis you have, right? The, whenever crisis happens, then you have to think about it, right? But when you have a a proper a comprehensive social safety net, so when the crisis happens. This spending comes immediately. It's because if a person loses their, their job, if a person loses their job, so they will get, for instance, uh, unemployment benefits that would that's time to fight him through uh, whenever he's, he's, he's down. So that, that spending would go back into the economy. So rather than the person lost his job, stop spending, and the person would lose his job, get assistance automatically. And they would, would spend these things. So the impact on the economy because of, of, of him losing a job is minimized. And if it's not just minimized, the response lag is also almost zero. Right, right, right. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I um, you know, for one of the questions that went through my mind is like, I mean, uh, of course, people like us, we love the idea of social safety net, right? Yep. Uh, sometimes when you talk about economy, or I use the word economy, we think like, that's not what the economy is about. Economy is about like big picture, whether the country, GDP, mm -hmm. growth rate, all this kind of things, stuff, right? Yeah. But actually, I mean, what is the economy except 
whether people on the ground are, you know, living okay or not, lah. Yep. Right? Yep. They really actually, actually, at the end of it, you know, after all the GDP COVID and everything, it really come back down to that question, doesn't it? You know, so yep. I think it's a interesting way to, not interesting way to, but it just, I mean, because, you know, that's not the, you know, I find that when I ask these questions, right, this, this same question, I, the answer that economists give me tend to be surprising. You know, like, uh, you know, you, you, <laughs> you talk about a social safety net is the first answer, right? Uh, you know, um, I talked to Alan, uh, yeah, I said, eh, the thing that we need is trust. I was like, what? <laughs> oh, it's true, it's true, it's true. But, but, but I, mean, I mean, it's true, right? I mean, I mean, it's a social capital. If, if you, you, know, it's, it's, you, if you like some jargon. You don't need to talk to me about social capital. I'm the one, right. the social true. capital evangelist of Malaysia. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it's true, it's true, social capital. I mean, I'm doing right now. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Uh, social capital is also important. I mean, if you don't have social capital, then people, the, the cost of doing business, if you want uh, to speak in that lingo, Will go up because people don't trust. So then suddenly, if you don't have, you have so much, don't have trust, then suddenly you spend a lot of money with lawyers, right? Lawyers will be rich <laughs> because because you don't yeah. have capital. You, yeah. you, you don't trust every person. So you don't trust every person. You try to protect yourself. Uh, so that's the part yeah. of doing business exactly, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, um, yeah. I, I, I'll, I'll just write this. You know, I mean, so of course, this is this is also part of Project Bangsa Malaysia, right? I mean, that's exactly social capital, building trust, you know, that, that sort of thing, you know, we, we, you know, it's a, I mean, it's a bit of an art, lah. this kind of thing is really, to some extent, trying to make something out of thin air, but, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm encouraged by what you said, you know, and this is something that we should uh, focus on a little bit more, saying that there is a economic value to this project, lah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. That more than one economist I spoke to told me that this. No, no, no. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, I mean, you have to remember that it, it, the economy is not just about GDP. I mean, the, the economy itself as a field is, is huge. I mean, even I cannot name every single thing that happened mm. in economics, right? I mean, I, I'm just a nobody. Uh, but yeah. And yeah. So, so, so hopefully, you know, I mean, as we go along, you know, I can say we will have many of these. Hopefully, we call on you once in a while to like, ah, now an economist will tell us why Bangsa Malaysia is important for the economy. <laughs> so, I mean, but, but I mean, I just, but, you know, just as, you know, we are here talking about this, but really, that is what we're trying to do. Yeah. And I think, yeah. I think, uh, you know, social capital in Malaysia is at a, you know, say an all-time low, you know? I mean, uh, I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, if you're interested in social capital, there are people that doing surveys for like 20, 30 years already. Uh, it's a world value survey. So in the world value survey, it's, it's, a, it's a bunch of questionnaire. So it, it tried to access the level of social capital, one aspect of the questionnaire. And you can see, I think the Malaysia has from 2004, 2004 I think. So you can see the, 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 the score that they rate Malaysia in terms of social capital, it's quite low. And there's one question that I remember the most is that this question asks whether would you trust a stranger how easy for you to trust a stranger or something like that. And in, in like, if you look at other countries like, like Japan, the number's like 40% or in the US even it's 50. I don't, I can't remember the number, but the number's quite high. Like. You in Malaysia is like seven, in the teens, in, in like 11%, 17%, uh, that kind of numbers. So that shows that people distrust each other. Like. Uh, and that's just like generally. And if you think about uh, ethnicity as well, then things get more complicated. Like. You know what this is like? This is like Raya and the Last Dragon. Did you watch that movie? No, I haven't. <laughs> the tagline, you know, somebody says, oh, um, you know, the world is all messed up, uh, you know, and we can't trust each other, you know? And then the, the dragon says, oh, maybe the world is messed up because you don't trust each other. <laughs> I mean, I mean there'd be a truth about that. I mean, social capital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, very interesting. I mean, so, you know, we, we really hope that, you know, I mean, some, some people, I think, look at our work this Bangsa Malaysia stuff and like, eh, this airy fairy, la la la, unity, you know, <laughs> always people will make fun of this unity stuff, but I think there is uh, something to it, 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 it really, I mean, and I like that, I like the term social capital because it works like capital, uh. when you have it, yeah. you can do things, you yeah. don't have it, you can't do things, you know, yeah, so it's, but, it's, yeah. it's hmm, tangible. But it's also the, the problem, uh, because social capital is, it's, you cannot feel it, right, and it's not easy to like, you place a capital, social capital. Yeah. It's, just, it's just not capable. It's like very, there's a word for it. Um, there's a, it's not a concrete thing. 
intangible. Does make it yeah, it's not intangible, right? It does make it does make it hard. Yeah, but it's a funny thing. I mean, you said you know you can't feel it, but in another sense of word, it is something you can only feel. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it's true, true. Yeah. true. If I, for instance, yeah. if you go to like in the middle of KL, you probably, I mean, it's probably zero social capital because you don't know anybody, right? Especially in the middle <laughs> street. But if you go to like your kampong, and everybody knows you, everybody says hi, whatever, then that's a high social capital, right? For that particular area. But look, for instance, like I, I think, I think. The highest social capital that I had was, was when I was in school, like, when everybody knows me. So you know, social capital is there, you know, it's like everybody trusts you, yeah, everybody yeah. knows you, everybody says hi. MCKK, kan? No, no, I'm talking about, yeah, yeah like, sure. But like, <laughs> I, I'm still referring to university, for instance, right? Um, yeah. And university, yeah, like, I, I'm whatever. Like. But for, for instance, when I, when I uh, walk to class, I have no idea what the dude that was sitting next to me and say hi every morning to me. It's like, okay, well, hi. Uh, so the, that kind of social capital, like right? people trust you, people feel safe, people feel secure. It's a safe space uh, to, to sit in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but if you go to the middle city, nobody cares about you. Even people you run down by a car, people probably wouldn't help you as well. Uh, yeah. So yeah. that thing about like social capital. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and you know, so I, I hope that you know, more and more people can see that our work to engineer this to build this kind of like sense of. You know, sense like we are in it together, lah. Like we are in the same boat, you know, and that we are, you know, the tagline of our project, Bosch Advanced Malaysia, is that there's more that unites us than divides us, lah. Uh. You know, we live in a in an atmosphere where politicians are incentivized to divide us, you know, and to memecah belakang, lah, basically, right? So, hopefully, we we you know we're gonna do some work on 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 reversing that trend. But I I, I think it is, you know, every, <laughs> this is what I was gonna say. You're an economist, right? I'm a comms guy, like I'm a spin doctor, more or less, right? Uh-huh. So, but, <laughs> but but you know, I think that is that is partly the space in which we create this thing, lah. You know, we create this sort of. You know, we were talking about this yesterday in education. <laughs> My sister warned us, you know, hey, don't use education as a place to brainwash children, eh? like DT and all that. Try and force them to love Malaysia, <laughs> which is a good uh, tagurang, of course, right? You don't want to go. But, but, but... I don't know, but but that's the purpose of education, right? <laughs> Brave. If, 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 if you read Plato, for instance, the Republic, that's what he wants to do. <laughs> yeah. Because the, the way the way you build a society is to build up people that have a shared values. Don't tell everybody lah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's that's what what communication is about. Yeah. You have a shared I mean, value. You, you have have course, so she put it in a better way, like, right? She was like, what what you want to do is if you want to create a safe space for people to fall in love with Malaysia rather than you know just try and force them and just stop pitching it. But it's true. I mean, you know, I think we can see from the time that we went to school, you know, even in national school, you know, kids today, there's a difference. Uh, there's a different vibe. Sure, sure. Less, less and less experience, but yeah, it's it's, it's a really interesting to like uh, talk about um, the economic aspect of it, economic value of it. I'm to go to one 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 more thing real quick uh, because it's uh, obviously you know, it's a uh, it's a huge thing, right? I got a little bit of inequality, right? Uh, yeah. What what are, what are some of your ideas? You know, like how we've been doing as far as inequality is it getting better, is it getting worse? What's what's making it getting worse? How do we reverse this trend? Besides our uh, social safety net, of course, that's a huge that's a huge step in the direction. But what else can we do? I mean, it seems like it's really really getting bigger and bigger. Like this is kind of like gap. It's really funny. I read that day. <laughs> you know, there's a um, like uh, Jeff Bezos uh, had a auction to auction seats next to him on his uh, flight to space. And then there was a petition for <laughs> to leave Jeff right. Bezos in space. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's quite funny but you know I mean all these Amazon things and you know, this is ridiculous like literally incomprehensible differentiation of uh, buying power you know as a kid I used to like I used to calculate the value of something like how many chicken rices is this equivalent to <laughs> you know and now it says you know you talk about millions billions it's really an sum that's like incomprehensible I mean I don't want to rent too much <laughs> you're supposed to be the panelist uh, tell us about inequality and what we should do about uh... it <laughs> I don't know. I'm probably I'm probably the wrong person to talk about inequality. I know this is an idea. This is uh, she's the uh, right person to talk to about this. But yeah, you're all I mean, I mean, up, but the... <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, I generally believe a little bit of inequality is probably good uh, because of terrible. No, 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 no. no they, 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 it's, matter, it's a matter of range, right? It's a matter of degree. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, to some degree, don't of expect, inequality. You, you don't expect yeah. everyone to be hundred yeah. 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 times yeah. yeah. logical. Yeah. 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 But, but uh, I mean, the gap does seem to be getting, getting bigger. You know, what, what, what do you think are some of the key things we can do to arrest that trend? I mean, I, I, think, I, think, I, I think this goes back to education at the end of the day. Because education is a great level, right? But if your education system is messed up, then the education system is not going to be that level there. 
uh, because because the thing is uh, the thing with with yeah, I think I think if you look really up economic literature about inequality, inequality has a lot to do with your parents. Uh, if your yeah, parents yeah. are already rich, and you're probably yeah, going to be yeah. rich. If your parents can be rich, you probably your parents rich probably have good education, and then you can have. My parents rich. are rich, but I've done a terrible job. <laughs> no, no, but but, but there's, there's, a, there's a correlation and causation over there. Yeah. So 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 the 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 point of public education is to level those those differences, right? So everybody goes to the same school, to school school system, and school provide like generally good education level, so people you know would want to go to public school. And then people interact, people have empathy for each other, people, you know, it's a good level of education of the education system. Uh, so that how that's that I think how you should manage inequality. This is a very long term, but also this is short term. There, there are short term measures right, like like redistribution of your tax income. Although some they, they, but 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 at the end of the day, for me, if it's you 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 get your education system right. And then a lot of this problem will solve by itself. It's not just education, also added stuff, right? But competitiveness, whatever. So it, it really goes down to your public education system. If the public education is just is messed up, then then the inequality gonna be there. Right? Because for instance, if you if you got your public education system is messed up, it's so bad that people that have money wouldn't want to send your their kids to the education system, right? So they will go to private systems, private, public education system, private, private, private school, so that they get the education that they, the that the parents want. So clearly, people that go to public school, most of the time, would have superior education because that's what they pay for. So when they have superior education, then, then you go to university, and then they can go to the best university. People that go to public education wouldn't go to the best university. They, some of them might, but most of them would, would you know, go to like mediocre school, like the, would they even go to public, would they even access university, go to university. So this itself is a, is a long-term driver of, of, of inequality. So again, you go back to my point, you get your education system right, and I think a lot of this problem would solve by itself. It's a, it could take a long term, probably 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, but... And you think that's probably more important than, you know, like a tax? A, a I mean, tax is important. I mean, tax is important, but it has to come together, right? Because, because, this, because again, this is like 30 years, but clearly we don't live for 30 years like we live now. Would you say that's a... Uh, um, for Malaysia specifically, that's one of the huge drivers of inequality, um, the disparity. I, 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 I don't have the measurement or whatever, but I would suspect it is. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not dismissing the role of tax, right? Um, when, we talk about, when we talk about social safety net, that's, that's, that's also a thing about tax as well. This is linked. If you want to build social safety then you have to have a proper taxation system. You cannot have a low tax regime like Singapore when you're running a country like 32 million people. Sure. So it comes together. There's no free lunch, right? Sure, it's not sure. like it's not like people like this. This say people think about you, the government can print money just like that. Is not actually true. I mean, the money comes from tax your tax system. Right, right. right. So, so okay. Uh, just I also can't uh, escape from this question. So now we're looking at planning Malaysia's economy, right? Um, what do you think would be some of the best drivers? What sectors should we be looking at? What should we be investing in? You know. What, oh, what? that's. I mean that that's that's a tough question like, because I think a lot of people have, a lot of smart people have thought about it and they haven't really got any result for a lot of it. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I, mean but, I, I can believe that a lot of people smart people are talking about it, but I'm not. I doubt that those conversations, the smart conversations, are the one that. No, they, this they, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. To be fair, I mean, the government. I mean, in some ways, our government for the past twenty years, maybe not today. <laughs> But uh, even under Najib, uh, even under Badawi and Mahdi, it's, there's a technocratic element to it, right? It, uh, there might be the technocratic element comes in at the expense of democracy, but it was a technocratic element. So they, they do know what they're talking about, but they just sometimes they just don't know how to do it. They know what's going on, what should be done, but they don't know how to do it. Because, because knowing and doing it are two different things, uh, right? Like, you can have a smart people thinking about a the problem, they understand the problem, but solving the problem is not necessarily. Uh, yeah, I mean, like uh, when I started in this line of this kind of work, I started with Kian Chua. He said a lot of things that I often quote like, 20 years later. <laughs> but you know, he talked about how uh, Mahathir set out to create, you know, he wanted to change Amro into a party or, you know, of, of entrepreneurs, right? Or captains of industry. And what he got instead was uh, you know, a party of rent seekers, like, basically. 
<laughs> they are knowing and doing different things. But yeah, but, but, uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it's a. I mean, I know it's a bit of a simplistic question, but you no, know, I think from a, again as lay person point of view, sometimes we still. You know what? What are the sectors do you think that would be? You know, where would you invest in? You know, if you were, yeah, I know a lot of smart people have discussed it, but tonight I'm talking to this smart person. <laughs> Take uh, your best guess. Uh, uh, I, you know, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people would say, you know, in the digital industries, uh, in the, but I really don't know. Like this, this one you have to talk to the to the technologies, like, uh, in fact. In fact, sometimes when you think about this question, you really multidisciplinary. You have to get people from different background to come together and talk. Uh, because you want the person by itself. If I, to, if I talk to the technologists, of course, the technology is here. Te- uh, technology is the way to go. I talk to the environment. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> sure, sure. But that's also oh, maybe, maybe based on like some trends, you know, what has been working, maybe for Malaysia, for the region, you know, also comparative advantages. Right. Yes, just, just some edit. I, I know. Nobody can say for sure, lah. Right? You yeah. <laughs> but your best yeah. cases. I don't know. I, I think if you talk simplistically, I think we need to be in some kind of industry that 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 integrated global supply chain. I don't know. Global global supply chain. In, in the sense that in the sense that I mean, if, if you have an industrial base, you it could be manufacturing or whatever that make it a strong enough and important enough that if any global if it's any global company that wants to have a supply chain, they have to come to Malaysia. Uh, I think that's what has been missing for the past maybe 10, 15 years. Uh, it's just um, the industrial capacity. I, I cannot say much because, you know, you get to get details, I, I, just, I, I, just, I don't know what. Uh, I mean, under, under the previous government, under Pakatan, they, they were talking about, you know, you have the infrastructure for your digital age. You have to you support, uh, you have a proper broadband line that support industrial needs. And so you, you build all these fiber optics throughout the country and, and all the cities, all the school, access with all the industrial zone would have access to it. And it's, yeah, and then you and then you make the country internet speed so fast that industry start to build itself on the on the connectivity. So you don't know what industry is, right? It can be services, it could be like whatever. People can't imagine. I mean, sometimes you can even imagine in industries like ten years ago, nobody could even imagine the right, 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 right share service, right industry. Nobody could think about it, or even cloud in cloud technology. Nobody could think about it. At least for the layman person, right now, even layman know what cloud computing is. So, so that's the thing. If you want to invest, you invest in your infrastructure properly. Uh, in, in in this current situation, I think you're building your broadband infrastructure well. Uh, I think the government has that plan, but it just it's very slow, lah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Very interesting. Um, maybe I couldn't can't resist this question as well. You know, global economy, right? Right. Um, you know, so now it's like big war, China, US, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, so how 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 do we fit in into that whole like global economy and this sort of like uh, competition and stuff like that? Any any what are some guiding principles should be? I mean, it's just. Uh, I don't think- yeah, I think it goes back to the supply chain, right? Because there's a there's a there's a tension between China and US. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, what do you call that? It's, there are some reason for some companies to you know diversify their supply chain. So what? Sorry. To diversify their supply chain. So yeah. instead of just having everything in in one market, your egg in one basket in China. So you diversify your your supply chain to Vietnam, Philippines, or or Thailand, Malaysia. So that that's I think in the short term what Malaysia should be doing, right? We, we capture this supply chain, we build our industrial base. So so and then that's in that way we industrialize we industrialize our economy. Uh, that, so is there a supply chain? Uh, just to clarify, do you mean like we should be producing materials for all these different countries, or meaning? No, uh, you know, you know uh, for instance, when you build a car, it's no longer one country building a car from scratch, right? There's a you a car and then you, you have this uh, company that that build your wheels, your your steering, your tires, your your electronics, your radio, whatever, from all over the world. They bring together. So that, that's that's our supply chain. Up. I mean, basically, what what I understand it. So what we we should do is that we should be one one country that participate in those kind of supply chain. It could it cannot be it can it doesn't have to be car. It could be some some aircraft wing yeah. which yeah. we do or some some electronics we actually we do. But we just not doing enough, 
right? Because everything is China these days. Mm-hmm. So because of this tension, this, uh, the supply chain are you know, being diversified a little bit. So Malaysia should be the one to you know, capture those, those diversifying supply chain. So, so our, our industry should, should, should respond well to the diverse supply chains around the world and we should be selling. Yeah, should, 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 our industry should, should uh, what call that? Uh, react to the changing situation, but I think we are not. Now. So we should be buying from everybody and selling to everybody. Uh, or buying from as many people as possible and selling to as many people as possible. Uh, no, I, no I, I, it's like, you know, it's just like you have an industrial capacity to participate in supply chain. I mean, you build something that this is that is required by, by, by the global economy. It's mm-hmm. not just like build something that, you know, cheap stuff, but also, you know, the high value stuff, I suppose. We're not Try to be a vital part of the global supply chain. Yeah. Some, you some say we're like, not doing that right now. That- I mean, we're doing that, but it's not as well as we should, right? Mm-hmm. Because if you, if, you, if you think about it, uh, like, like, like a year ago or two, when the, the, the trade war was at its worst, people were talking about how Vietnam is like, <laughs> you know, doing really well uh, because, it, yeah, because everybody's going to Vietnam. Malaysia didn't, didn't, didn't get there as much because of the, of the crisis that we have right, uh, since then. Like, since, since so they are an example of a successful participation in global supply chain. Uh, so. I'm sorry? So Vietnam is an example of successful participation in the global supply chain. In, in, the, in, the, in the recent years. Right, right, right. Okay, just really quick. Uh, I think uh, Hamid said he's got like some four questions for you. Maybe you can, uh, maybe what uh, you can uh, just quickly list out all four and then uh, Hafiz can try to take them real quick. Thanks, Hamid. Welcome. It's our uh, Works with Power and Poja Vansa Malaysia. It's been a great uh, help to us. <laughs> and as an economic student, if I'm not mistaken, so yes. go for it. Mm-hmm. So very, very, very nice to meet you, Hafiz. And so my first question is, uh, like our colonial roots, our economy is built on, you know, extractive um, activities, right? And so the government had to step in. Uh, there was the whole dawn raid. We, uh, you know, instead of the surplus moving to the center uh, from the periphery, it sort of stayed in Malaysia. And then there was a lot of state intervention and we had like, uh, you know, NEP. We also had, a, you know, the affirmative action and and then, and then it led to, uh, we've also had like Malaysia Inc. And, and Dr. Terence Gomez has uh, spoken a lot about this, right? About how like uh, our public-private mix is, is sort of unique. And so now it's led to a lot, you know, like you said, it's led to a lot of good in the sense of you've got a robust middle class. Um, the economy is, uh, is not really, is not, you know, filled with multinationals, for example, there is some sort of redistribution. But at the same time, we've got, um, departments with inflated budgets, for example, we've got GLCs that are ineffective, not really transparent, sort of like a political pawn. Uh, positions in the GLCs are used as like political pawns, and also you end up with you know like infant industries that um, that didn't grow up basically, right? And all of these failures, what does it mean for Malaysia moving forward in the balance between the market and the state? How are we going to um, how, how do we find, like, how do we balance that, that, uh, that pool, right? Uh, I, I, I actually don't want to answer that, but I suppose, I mean, I, mean, I, I think you have to remember we, we live in a mixed economy uh, and, and, and uh, actually, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, as an okay. GLC is another big thing. Uh, but maybe yeah, the, the rest of your questions are short versions, maybe. Okay, you know? perfect, perfect. Um the other one was actually uh just related to innovation policy, like uh net uh discussed and and you know, like automation, for example, and just like our education system being uh, its ability to support these sort of things. Do you see it happening by any chance? Sorry, what automation? Uh, like automation and like, you know, computer science and that whole range, right? Do you think we'll ever, do you think we're on the verge of being able to like produce semi, uh, semiconductors or like uh, we, silicon chips or whatever? We, we, we are producing semiconductors. I mean, which oh, is... Sorry, it's, um, uh, microchips. Uh, I, I think we, we I, I think our, 
I mean, there's a lot of problem with our industrial base, but I think we are advanced enough to produce microchips right now. Yeah, uh, sorry, we will produce. Uh, but but in terms of coming to me, but yeah, do you think but, we could uh, automate our industry, our, our economy? Uh, I think I think eventually it's gonna happen. Uh, I think it's just it's just a global trend. Uh, it's probably gonna happen. Uh, it's just a matter of when. And and if you want to do all this automation at the end of the day, you have you have to have your like we mentioned just now, like your infrastructure, your broadband infrastructure. Uh, you, you have to be able to support high speed internet. Because um, right now, right now we sometimes we have trouble getting 3Gs, right? <laughs> Even in KL. So so that's probably have to be solved before before we can properly have uh, uh, high speed internet. People are talking about 5Gs that's supposed to come, but it hasn't come yet to Malaysia. Uh, but then again, it will come up once you have the infrastructure ready. I think right now our strategy is not there yet to support large scale automation. Okay. okay. Thanks very much, Hamid. Good questions. Uh, and okay, uh, maybe as a bit of a closing, um, you know, this one may not be so hardcore economics question, but uh, you know, so we are trying to work hard on this uh, Bangsa Malaysia project and stuff like that. Uh, do, you, do you have any personal thoughts on that? You know, um, you know how, how identity and things like that. How how how, how just. Curious, <laughs> different people got different reactions to this Bangsa Malaysia stuff. Do you think it's important, worth investing in, you know? Uh, uh, yeah, I don't think it's important, but so at the same time, I, I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm moving out of my comfort zone and saying this, like, I'm clearly not in a sociologist or whatever. Yeah, but, right. but, uh, but, uh, you're a Malaysian and that gives you the right yeah, to. Yeah. But, but, I, but I, I think it's important because I'm a bit, uh, you know, I grew up in the urban areas. I think over the years, English has started to become my first language right in Malay. Uh, so just judging my background, I think I think I'm more biased to it having Bangsa Malaysia. Uh, especially because I grew up in the 1990s as well, right? During during the Mahdi's time, which ironically he championed Bangsa Malaysia. Uh, but at the same time, I also need to acknowledge that there's a constant constatation of values between the urban areas, which is Bangsa Malaysia. And and the and the and the what do you call it and the other entities like especially the the, the Malay entities which not necessarily happy with with the system of Bangsa Malaysia so yeah. there's a consistent value so how do you reconcile between the two values yeah I think yeah. it's no easy answer there's no answer even I think yeah there's some uh, there's some uh, of course you know we've been doing this for a while and. Uh, you know, there's, there's an interesting uh, uh, dichotomy sometimes. Sometimes the, the non Malays they feel like this Bangsa Malaysia stuff is a, you know, nak memelayukan mereka. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Ultra Malays, they feel like, yeah, ini nak menyak melayukan mereka. So, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, that, that yeah. sometimes that means you, what, you, what you actually have is the correct one. Uh, but, but this idea of like Malay backlash is definitely not uncommon. Uh, we, we, we do get that. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. we have our. Yeah. I mean, uh, there will be other <laughs> dialogues in which we cover this directly, lah, right? But in yep. terms of like trying to sell this idea, actually, right. what right. important aspects? So we we want to try and make the connection that you know this Bangsa Malaysia stuff, this idea of like shared identity, shared sense of purpose, can actually have an impact on things that day to day things that people care about, and it is not just a like identity yes. about you know uh, unity, patronas as and that kind of stuff, but you know that this this uh, sort of like way of thinking can contribute to lower chicken prices, to better jobs and things like that. Do you think that's a really hard sell to make or? Yeah. Oh, I, mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, it's not, it's not a simple argument to make. Lah. I mean, if you say like, if you believe in Bangsa Malaysia, then the chicken price is going to fall down. And people will like, <laughs> make a frown, lah, right? <laughs> uh, but, but, but I mean, I mean, in a very convoluted way, it is possible, right? Because it goes back to the, our, our discussion just now about, about social capital. Even so, if you have high social capital, then the cost of doing business is going to be low. It's going to be lower than it is right now anyway. Yeah. But, but whether that can translate into lower chicken price, that's a bit hard. <laughs> but but there, there is an element that the cost of doing business, there is that element. It's just that measuring it or even grasping it is not that easy, right? It's very tangible. Yeah, so that's our job. Lah. We're going to try and make it a bit more tangible, but it's a challenge. But you know, that's a, it's a tough sell, but I, I think that's what we're going to try and do. Lah. I think if we can make it a connection, this idea you know, has a, more legs. Lah. <laughs> 
Okay, it's almost 10 o'clock. Uh, thanks for talking for us as well. I mean, do you have any other wrap-up comments or, or thoughts that you want to share? Anything that we missed? Please, by all means. Yeah. Uh, uh, Hamid, I'm, I'm sorry about your question just now. I mean, mm. about your GSC. I mean, I mean, this, this, I mean, I don't know. I, I was in a book club the other day about how Asia works, right? Um, and, and we would discuss about China and how China has SOEs and there was tension between SOEs and the state. Uh, and then and that pretty much influenced Chinese industrial policy. Uh, and the SOE is gonna, always going to be there. It's just a matter of managing those SOEs and, and, and giving space to the private sector. I mean, in Malaysia, the GLCs are quite big, right? The banks uh, especially are quite influential. And, and, and then for some reason, we focus a lot on real estate, also because of GLC. Uh, and then the private sector is just not, has really no incentive to do, to do whatever, to do, to, you know, to introduce something really, you know, kind of break two kind of things. They just don't have the incentive because everything is GLCs. And I know. So okay. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. It is, a, it is a complex issue for sure. Uh, all right. Uh, anything else, Hafiz, uh, before we, we wrap up? Any other closing comments or thoughts? No, I don't think. Yeah. All right. Thank you very, very much. We do appreciate your time and explaining to dummies like me <laughs> how this whole damn thing works. Um, I mean, it's one of those things, you know, like sometimes, and I think it's one of the reasons why some, you know, the bad guys stay in power, they make it look so complex and so convoluted. I mean, it's a bit of yes minister kind of thing also, right? That, that, that other people just like, ah, you know, I just incomprehensible and things like that. So we, we really want to try and break through that veil, like, you know, and, and see how we can get more voices, in, you know, participating in this self-decision-making process, this policy-making process. Uh, and this is a, just a small conversation with a small group of people, but hopefully it's a step in the right direction and um, set, a, set a tone for what we're trying to do. Like. So we really, really appreciate your time and uh, insight. Nice. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, thank you Hamid thank you Julian for, for making this happen uh, Nadia wherever you are I hope uh, I hope everything's okay on your side uh, we'll definitely pick up the conversation with you another time um, but okay I think that's it thanks for staying everyone it's been a real pleasure All right. okay. All right. thanks very much Hafiz thanks All right. Bye -bye. take care Good night. salam bangsa Malaysia <laughs>